Welcome to the Up Arrow Podcast with William Harris, featuring top business leaders sharing strategies and resources to get to the next level. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey everyone, I'm William Harris. I'm the founder and CEO of Element and the host of the Up Arrow Podcast, where I feature the best minds in e-commerce to help you scale from 10 million to 100 million and beyond, as well as help you up arrow your business and your personal life. Really excited about the guest that I have today, Tim Calise. Tim was Alex Hormozzi's number two at Gym Launch and Allen. He's the host of Leveling the Field podcast. He's a versatile entrepreneur, investor, and consultant who helps service business owners uncover the profits hidden inside of their existing business and has recently been named president of coaching at Wealth Without Wall Street, where he could take his 20 years of experience to help folks pursue financial freedom in business and life. Tim, welcome to the show. William, thank you for having me. I am excited to be here and looking forward to the conversation. So thank you. Likewise. Uh, today, folks, I am going to stretch your brains a little bit. Tim's expertise is not e-commerce, which is a, a little bit of a deter from what I normally would do, but he's a killer when it comes to building and growing service-based businesses. Uh, and he and I have chatted about how to use our lateral thinking to take what he's doing in the service industry and apply it to the e-commerce world. Um, so you'll find that I do this a lot. I'm a big fan of lateral thinking. Uh, in fact, uh, before I got into e-commerce, I came from the SaaS world and I was able to bring what I learned about LTV to CAC ratios to absolutely dominate a lot of other e-commerce competitors uh, because of the lateral thinking. Because uh, at the time in e-commerce, a lot of people were focused more on immediate profit instead of LTV to CAC ratios. And so uh, lateral thinking being something I'm excited about. Um, before we get into the meat, though, I do want to announce our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Element. Element is an award-winning advertising agency optimizing e-commerce campaigns around profit. In fact, we've helped 13 of our customers get acquired, with the largest one selling for nearly $800 million and one that IPO'd recently. You can learn more on our website at element.com, which is spelled E-L-U-M-Y-N-T.com. That's enough of that. On to the good stuff. Tim, I am a big fan of Alex Ramosi. Um, I've read his book, hundred million dollar offers, and, uh, he skyrocketed over the last couple of years. You were his number two. So I got to ask, what was your favorite part about working with Alex? So Alex is probably, as most people know him, he is a walking, talking pattern interrupt. That is the public version of him. You know, you would never say, or prior to the last two years, you wouldn't say, Hey, William, I have a guy who looks like a lumberjack. <laughs> is probably smarter than you know ninety nine percent of the financial minds you've ever spoken to, and is driven like no one you've ever met. Yeah. It's it's just a combination that just didn't exist. And I am incredibly fortunate and honored to have that experience. Um, you know, in in some of the early videos that he posted to YouTube, it's basically him sitting in an, a blank office. There's a whiteboard behind him, little American flag on the floor. That was uh, the casita outside of his house, uh, and I was very fortunate to to be able to live nearby and and really just soak up uh, all of the knowledge uh, that uh, that he was uh, spewing at that time. So probably my favorite times were when the cameras were off, we were hanging out, and it was just like two people who had, were both driven, uh, both wanting to call it stretch their kind of mental and physical capabilities um and we definitely had a streak of like we, we had alignment around we want to we've got some stuff to prove uh and i think it was a lot of fun to be able to have uh kind of aligned interests in that way no that's cool i i laughed maybe harder than i should have when you said the uh the lumberjack um yeah. you know the the brawny paper towels yeah i also felt like he looked like the brawny paper towel lumberjack and i yeah. actually i mocked this up and i shit it on linkedin he didn't comment and i was so sad but Totally, totally get where you're going with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Were there any any crazy stories that happened about him where, like, I don't know, maybe, you know, he orders his pizza, he orders a pepperoni pizza only to pick all the pepperonis off because he doesn't like him. Is like, there anything like that that you could remember? You know, we ate a lot of sushi. Uh, that was okay. a, a popular, uh, popular go-to. Um, yeah, I mean, you he's been very public with kind of how he organizes his nutrition. Uh, and so mm -hmm. just for those that are not familiar, uh, Alex effectively his like go-to at night and he has hashtag don't skip dessert. 
uh, is basically he used to eat a pint of ice cream and he would eat candy all the time. And people would say, <laughs> how the heck do you do this while kind of maintaining the figure that he has and, and the stature that he has? And he worked out obviously very, very hard, um, right. but he was all muscle. I mean, it's the reality. So, um, yeah. so I think some of those intricacies were, were pretty fun, but, um, going to his house, grilling, hanging out, um, were, were some times that I would, uh, I would absolutely cherish, uh, for, for a very long time. But as far as peculiarities, um, he had a cat named Billy, which I, oh, as nice. foreshadowing, uh, was short for, for billionaire. Um, uh, and so, yeah, it's, uh, he knew exactly where he was going from a very early age, even before, you know, all of this kind of transpired. And I knew him on the ascent, not at the, I have $1,700 in my bank account. Uh, but when Jim launch was starting to move, uh, and I'm very, very thankful for, for the time to be able to help bring part of that story to fruition. That's cool. Um, speaking of moving into like Jim launch and then even Alan, you co-developed Alan, uh, which for those who aren't aware, uh, Alan, uh, A L A N, uh, is an AI driven SaaS platform. Um, and it's achieving a remarkable growth, uh, from zero to $20 million in six months, which is yeah. just sensational. Um, but that's not the best story here. From what I understand, you you took Alan on almost as an accident. Maybe you're just a yes. glutton for punishment. Um, what was the story of you ended up yeah. taking on Alan? Yeah, so probably both of those statements are true. Uh, so at the time, <laughs> uh, I uh, was the VP of business development for Jim Launch. And Jim Launch uh, had, uh, at the time, three, call it uh, child companies, three divisions. There was the coaching business, which is what most fe- most people are familiar with. We had a supplement brand, a supplement business called Prestige Labs, and we had Alan. And the thing that united all of them were was uh, Alex started Gym Launch to help gym owners make more money. So the first was gyms needed a better business model. And so he pioneered the six-week high transformation challenge, which is effectively a high ticket front end offer in a prior to that very competitive low ticket type space. I mean, the gym industry has been, you know, kind of obviously Planet Fitness at $10 a month, uh, you know, up up to wherever you can charge, right? So that was where he started. And after gym owners kind of implemented the process or the business model that, that, was, uh, uh, that was supported underneath the gym launch umbrella, one other way to do that was to sell supplements as a part of the offering. Once those two things were effectively dialed in, the and and just for kind of context here this is like 2018 2019 facebook ads started they weren't you know 5 cents a piece anymore they were 50 cents to a dollar you know we saw kind of the the trend of acquisition was getting harder and harder and in gyms at that time we taught gym owners how to nurture their leads so if you ran paid campaigns you'd get an opt in on average one out of eight opt ins in a fitness facility would ever even walk through the door of the gym. Mm, sure. Now, you can imagine when you're paying a penny, five cents, 10 cents, the waste doesn't feel all that expensive. Move that to a dollar a piece, $2.50 a piece, $5, $10. It becomes really painful. And despite telling everyone exactly what to do, and for anyone who's ever run a brick and mortar business before, getting someone like the front desk person or a part timer to care as much about that nurture process as you is very, very difficult. And so I, it really started with this idea of like, well, heck, we'll just do it for them. And so another gentleman on the team uh, started to build what became Alan. Fast forward to uh, the fall of 2019. We have a summit, an executive team, a bunch of us are getting together, quarterly planning. We've all kind of been in those situations before. And our phone rings uh, and it says, the guy who runs this project didn't get on the plane. What do you mean he didn't get, didn't on, the get on the plane? It's like, what do you mean he didn't get on the plane? He's supposed to be like presenting kind of like the status of where this thing is. Didn't get on the plane. The next message after that is, and he's not coming back. He's out. Wow. So there's four of us on the executive team, Alex, Layla, our CFO, and myself. Alex and Layla are effectively running the business, co-CEOs. 
our CFO is doing what she did phenomenally well, making sure that we all kind of had jobs and everything got paid for and all of that. Yeah. So by definition, it was like, tag, you're it. So I had <laughs> never run a software business before. So we had 32 offshore developers. We had a team of about eight people onshore uh, on our team that were doing, you know, customer success and development and things like that. And so I learned trial by fire. And it was like, we need this thing to come to market. We're already pre-selling it. We kind of gave people an expectation. And effectively from September of 2019 through December of 2019, we built an entire uh, software package, software platform, effectively from the ground up uh, wow. with data science, with a data science team, et cetera, et cetera. So you started off by saying, I think I'm a glutton for punishment. Somebody once <laughs> said, I am the equivalent of like a business firefighter. When everybody oh, else is running out nice. of the building, I seem to run in. I don't know which wire got crossed uh, within me, uh, but I love those types of situations. And we launched uh, that following January. Uh, and in six months, fortunately or unfortunately, COVID actually played very well for us. Uh, we generated over $1.7 million a month in, in MRR. So about a $20 million run rate. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. I think the thing, I, well, I like the firefighter illustration, but I, I think the thing that I appreciate here is we, we've established your credibility, your chops in this. And so what I wanted to get into is uh, I want to understand your, fr your framework here that you've put together, mm -hmm. which is product to profit, um, because I think that that's something that you've, you've carried with you through all of these different businesses and that now you're using to help other people with their businesses. What is the product to profit framework and, and, and how is this yeah. helpful? Yeah. So I think one of the things that I want to set kind of as context is my background is in finance. I have started businesses purely out of the desire to help someone move from their current state to a better future ideal state. I am not a marketer from a tactician perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's important because I approach these initiatives product first more so rooted in the idea that if we can put an exemplary product out into the market, it takes a lot of the pressure off of, call it the acquisition process and things like that. And totally. uh, you talked about Alex, and, and one of the things, it was an edict effectively that, that we carried was, if we could not acquire another customer right now for, the for eternity, and the only way we can grow is by referral, what needs to be true about our product or service to make that a viable business? And you very quickly go to like, oh, if I only have one customer, I would be really hands-on. I would drive all this value. I would do all these things. It's like, well, then you should probably do those things, right? And so I, I give that content simply, context simply because um, the product to profit framework is built around the idea of product at its core, and then wrapping an economic model around that, that release, relieves the pressure on, on cash flow and investment to try to get your money back as soon as possible. You know, you were talking about uh, CAC to LTV ratios. One of the things we do is in the context of effectively earning more than it costs to acquire the customer, is how do we build an ecosystem, a, a process, that is optimized for getting our CAC back as quickly as possible while not losing sight of the uh, the opportunity to grow into LTV. Mm -hmm. And to to for those that have ever been in the SaaS uh, space, there's a concept called land and expand. Yes. Yep. Right? So anybody who's in that world is very familiar. The, the concept being take Salesforce or HubSpot or any of these big platforms. You make one sale and the more integrated the company is into that one sale, the more seats you can sell, the more secondary products you can sell. So it's a, a single sale with growth on the back end. And I've just taken a lot of those same principles and the principles that got Jim launched to grow from zero to $50 million a year in revenue to help the next round of entrepreneurs see things in that way to optimize, again, taking the pressure off of cash. 
Yeah, we would talk about uh, negative revenue churn, right? The idea yep. was it's like, okay, great. You might actually have some customer churn, some other revenue churn, but if you can upsell yeah. those current customers enough, then you've actually created negative revenue churn like in, yeah. in, in totality, which is a, yeah. a brilliant place to be if you can get there. And, and I've seen few yeah. do it. Um, HubSpot, I remember, uh, wrote a good article about when they had made that happen. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good spot to be. Yeah. So what is, what is your... What is your framework? How, like, what does it yeah. look like? Yeah. So let me walk through. There's basically three basic components to it. What, where I see people go wrong, especially in high ticket and things like that, they try to go from cold traffic to selling a core offer. So that mm-hmm. looks like I'm going to go out to try to convince someone to spend $2,000, $5,000, $10,000, $50,000 on my core offer. The problem with that in most cases is you have to shell out a lot of money on the front end and hope that over time you get that money back. To use a, a gym analogy, because this is, was really important for me, I, I owned eight gyms at one point. When you have a, let's just say a, a free trial, as an example, gyms offered free trials all the time, mm-hmm. and it's 30 days. If I spend $50 to get a prospect in the door today, I convert, let's, let's say I'm really good. I convert one out of two. I've spent $100. Mm-hmm. Then they have 30 days of free trial. And then hopefully they sign up. So let's just say I can, I'm really good again and I get 50% of those people to continue. I now have paid $200 to get a sale. And now let's say that my monthly rate is $50 to use easy math. I'm going to go another four months before I recapture the money that I've spent. This is why service businesses in particular feel like they're always broke. Because by the time you get to the end of that, call it five to six month period, now customers are starting to leave Mm -hmm. and attrition is now taking over and the the bucket is now leaking effectively faster than you can acquire. And you you just burn money. So what we do is we say, okay, again, sticking with the fitness analogy, I can't get someone to lose 50 pounds in a day or two days or a week. Right. But can I, in a week, give somebody uh, success at a smaller goal, at a lower price point to earn the right to transition them into our long term program? And so, what that might look like, especially in e commerce, is a, 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 you know, the, the, where I've seen this work as well. Um, what is the starter product or the starter service that we can wrap around? that sale that makes it easy for someone to say yes. So you Mm -hmm. create a customer and then earn the right to create a client. So we break those up into two steps is effectively how we do it. And sometimes, and this is where the, the, the interesting part comes, we actually have to create a dedicated product to sell on the front end to liquidate that acquisition cost. Sure. And so that's the third piece of this. So one is, understanding creating the customer. The second is what is the goal? And the third is what product do we need to create usually out of the existing assets in the business to make that all happen? It's, it's genius. Um, you know, it reminds me of a couple of things that we did in the SaaS world as well. Um, even just that idea of the, the, the free trial that you were talking to about, uh, one of the, the things we would always say is you got to get the customer to the wow uh, as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. Ideally, that same login that they have. Um, and that same thing is going to be true for um, e-commerce. So I'll come to that. But the idea of getting them to the wow and SaaS for us was if they, if they log out of that first session, they, they literally go into the computer, they create their trial and you let them leave from that trial without them going, Oh, I get this. And I understand why this is such a big deal. The likelihood of them coming back was very, very, very small. They've created the trial and they just aren't going to come back. That was true for so many trials. Um, in the e-commerce world, then the same thing is true when somebody gets that first product from you. If they get that first product from you and they don't immediately get it, they don't have the wow factor that you wanted them to have, your likelihood of them coming back for that second, third, fourth purchase, no matter how many times you advertise or email them or whatever that is, it dramatically goes down. And so the more that you can do to get them to understand and really see and appreciate the full value of that product um, immediately uh, is, is the most beneficial thing you can do. Yeah, spot on. And uh, I have a framework that that I work through uh, with a lot of folks. And there's there's only six ways that we deliver product. Three of them are physical and three of them are digital. Okay. So you have 
physical products and digital products. You have physical and digital services. And you have physical and digital access. Mm. So you have six levers that you can pull. So the question is, based on who your avatar is that you're talking to and the promise you make, which one of those levers needs to be pulled and in what order to maximize and to optimize exactly that moment of wow. And I think mm -hmm. we sometimes underappreciate, we think what can we provide? Like we start from our perspective instead of saying, what does the customer actually need? And how can I bring that to bear as quickly and efficiently as possible? And that might be a JV with another provider. It might be an affiliate relationship. It might be something the customer actually doesn't care. Mm -hmm. However, we care because I want to be the person who has earned the trust of the customer, even if I am using other providers to deliver upon the message. Mm, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's smart. Um, you mentioned to me that uh, another part of this framework, you, you talked about it being a singles game. Um, what, what do you mean by this being a singles game? Yeah. So I will say I made big mistakes early on in my professional career. And if I was to boil it down, the mistakes I made when launching new companies, new products was I built them first and then sold them. And I invested a lot thinking, oh, I, I kind of know whatever, you know, I know what the client wants to some extent. And this one's going to be kind of, I'm trying to hit doubles and triples because I had to recoup my investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have now taken the complete opposite perspective. So now, and, and just think of commonly held uh, sayings like, um, you want to get to a hundred no's. You know, you just have, it's sure. about how many offers sure. you can make. Yep. Now imagine what, like, like, at least this is me. I didn't have the mental fortitude to say, I have invested my blood, sweat, tears, capital, money, time, attention, et cetera, into something, let me go get a hundred no's. That's like saying, I'm gonna get punched in the face a hundred times and still, sure. and still show up because I took it personally. And I think I've seen this yeah. go wrong so many times. It, it's hard to withstand that kind of pressure and impact. Totally. Change the lens for a second, which is, imagine if I reached out and said, hey, hey William, I have this idea. I'm thinking about building this thing. I'm thinking about building a course for e-commerce providers to help them go from 10 million to 20 million while working half the time. If I built something like that, does that sound like something you'd be interested in? And you might yeah. say yes, you might say no, you might say yeah, but uh, yes, but I'd love for it to have this, this other component. Now my search of 100 no's is 100 pieces of feedback Mm. And it's about the idea, which I have not invested in yet, so I don't take it personally, mm -hmm. which allows me to now have velocity of offer, offer a, a velocity of trial. And so I now try to think about how many singles can I hit, which is a volume game, mm -hmm. and staying in the game rather than trying to hit doubles, triples, home runs, et cetera, et cetera. Mm, I love that. Um Obviously, talking baseball. In case anybody's wondering what we're talking about with singles, doubles, and triples. Yeah, most people probably get it, but you never know. No. There might be somebody who's like, "I don't play baseball. I don't know that sport." Um, I really appreciate that approach. I think that it's so easy. It, it kind of reminds me of the le yes ladder and and other mm -hmm. things of incrementality that we do here as well. Where it's just like, if you can get the yes ladder, it's just like that one small incremental thing here. You're almost like doing that to yourself where you're giving yourself the ability to get like that, those little small commitments, you're refining the product now. So when you go to offer, you've got something that is very well refined um, and you've got the feedback that you needed to make that happen. I think that's um, yeah. it's just genius. And, and, you know, in SaaS is a great example. You know, a lot of people say I have to raise capital to be able to bring my idea to market mm -hmm. or I need to, I need to raise money to do this. Most businesses actually don't need that. Most. There are some that do, yeah. but most business, like I built more kind of things that have turned into software or SaaS or other things off of an Excel spreadsheet. And it's like, just imagine for me, I was like, I'm going to duct tape, duct tape and chewing gum. But if I did something like this and you could put a number in here and there's a bunch of calculations and you get this thing out, if I was to smooth that and make the, the UX UI better, but I validated the core idea. Mm -hmm. We actually built a piece of software that never saw the light of day. Alex has talked about this, actually. Um, 
we spent almost $2 million developing. Really? And nobody still knows about it because it di- it, it's on the shelf. Mm-hmm. And the reason why it died was be two things. One is we believed that the market would eat it up and, and desire it much more than they actually responded, number one. And number two, we way over-engineered it. So when we went to tell people about it, it's like, well, just tell me what it does. It's like, well, it does this, 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 this. And someone's like, well, if it just did this, I'm a buyer. Right. If it just right. did this, I'm a buyer. Nobody wanted to buy the suite. And as anyone who's ever switched from a CRM, yeah. switching costs is actually the biggest cost. It wasn't a financial thing. People were just like, I, I can't even make a decision because you know, this is a, a huge business risk that I'm taking. And so I didn't make saying yes easy. Yeah. And the clarity of the so, thought. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I like where you're going with the clarity of the thought too, like the clarity of the offer. Um, I forget where I was at that I ran into this very recently. Uh, and it was something where it's like, there's, it, it does to your point, five things. And it probably does all five things very well, but it was enough that it caused confusion where it's like, it's very easy. If it's like, Oh, it does this one thing. You're like, okay, great. Done. I'm, I'm ready yeah. to sign up. Cause I know exactly what it is. I know that that's a pain that I have. Let's go for it. But it's five things. You're like, well, I don't know. Now I have yeah. to think about it more. It takes me a little bit more time to think about it and decide if I actually need this. Do I actually understand what you're selling or, or not? And uh, that makes it harder. And, and the um, takeaway there could also be if you feel like you are susceptible to this, if you have a, a quote unquote kind of complicated or complex thing, break it apart. I have a 10 year old mm-hmm. son. We loves Legos. If you can take, I think we live in a world right now where micro products are going to be rewarded. Mm. Micro sure. products will be rewarded. So, so start to pull some of these bundles apart because you will optimize for the different avatars. Uh, and then once you earn the trust, then you can cross sell and all like, I mean, SAS has been doing this for a long time, buy my CRM and bolt on the marketing widget or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it might be, the finance widget, Salesforce and others have, have done these things. So, but you have to I make the, it, the first decision easy. hundred percent. And I think it goes in waves. Like, I, I yeah. feel like I see that all the time where it's like, there's, there's the aggressive, uh, single function SaaS businesses that come out. Uh, and then, and then there's all of the, you know, aggregation that takes place and now they're all doing everything. And then there's the next wave of, okay, well, we're going to go back to reinventing these single jobs to be done, right? If you're going to go with the jobs yeah. to be done framework, the, the single job to be done, uh, thing again. And then there's the next round of aggregation. And I think it's going to continue to always just go in those ways. But I do think that you're right where it's like, I think we've gone through a wave of aggregation and we're back into, especially with the advancement of AI right now, we're back into a yeah. singular focus. Uh, you know, how can we disrupt this very specific core thing? Yeah. Yeah. Talk about parallel thinking. I came out of the finance industry. I ran a hedge fund for a number of years and it's really in- interesting. Kind of, It tracks similarly, like the interest in smaller managers versus really, really large financial institutions ebbs and flows with the levels of perceived risk that are in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. So just to, what that actually means is smaller hedge fund managers and asset allocators and things like that, generally speaking, have better returns. And the reason for that is when you're smaller, you can be more agile and get into different situations. When you are Bridgewater Associates, Ray Dalio, and you have $150 billion you have to move, <laughs> everybody owns Apple, everybody owns Google, every, like yep. the, all the big guys start to coalesce around the same ideas. Well, you could say, well, don't investors want max returns? Like not in periods of 2008, not in the periods of put, like there are periods sure. where people go, it's a flight to safety. I care more about compliance uh, you know, and stability than I do about chasing returns. So I think yeah. it really, it, just to use a similar analogy, I think sometimes it's like, I want the specialty tool for the thing that I want. Mm-hmm. And then you go, well, now I have 27 specialty tools. Exactly. Now just give me the platform where I can get most of those things. And then you run that for a year or two. And then you go, well, we're kind of like a five out of 10 across the mm-hmm. board. I'm going to go find this. So I just think it's the nature of the ebb and flow. And, and I think you're exactly right. Yeah. Depending on, yeah. on situation. I, yeah, hundred percent. I want to come back to something else you you were talking about here, which was you know the, the hitting singles. Because I'm, I'm still stuck on that. I really like this metaphor 
I'm thinking about, you know, basically what you talked about is an MVP, right? A minimum mm-hmm. viable product. So you're, you're able to get out there. And the minimum viable product is, is actually just asking a question about the business itself. Like that's the most minimum viable, right? But, but this idea of minimum viable product, and I want to I kind of translate this then into e-commerce because oftentimes uh, there's, uh, there's significant costs to creating a new product in e-commerce, just like there would be in SaaS and, and developments, right? And so the minimum viable product that I see here, and I've, I've uh, helped a couple of people do this, and I really like this approach, um, sometimes would be, let's say that you're coming out with a new uh, flavor of something. Uh, you, you can have this as a landing page where like, let people actually even vote on it. If you're mm. not sure which one to invest your R&D into, you can gamify this in a way where you can actually send them to a landing page. It's like, hey, which one do you want us to come out with? And I think this is a brilliant way to get that uh, engagement from your core audience, who likely is your buyers, um, and help you to know which one they're more interested in. Because you can have two really radical ideas. Um, and this doesn't have to be flavors. This could be, you know, uh, color of pants or whatever this might be, right? But uh, give them the opportunity to be able to basically be a part of that development process for you. And I think that creates, um, it's kind of like the hitting singles maybe in the e-commerce space. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're, you're, you're spot on. And I mean, you might know this and I'm forgetting if it's hundred million dollar leads or hundred million dollar offers, but that's exactly what Alex did. Yeah. He split tested the name. He split tested the subheadline, et cetera. Because he went out to the audience and said, which ones of these resonate with you? And so when he came out, it was amazing. You know, everybody kind of gravitated towards the winner. So I think there's a lot of power in that. I just think we're, yeah. I don't want to make generalizations, but I know through my evolution as a person, in the beginning, it's almost, and, and my upbringing, I always had this thing in my head, which was kind of the smartest person in the room wins. I mean, just think about early in your life. You're like, the, kid, the, the, the kids that get A's arguably are smarter than the kids that get C's. Well, Gary V is on record saying, I was a horrible student and the, you know, the whole nine yards, sure. right? But I think in business, the more inquisitive the mm. person, the more potential success they have because they don't want to, they're not sticking to their answer. They are in pursuit of an answer, the answer that is right for the market. And I think sometimes we're fighting our own egos. Like, why wouldn't I go and talk to someone? What if they think my idea is bad? What if my opinion is different? Like, I, mm-hmm. it just goes back to kind of the longer I live, and I think a lot of people have come to similar conclusions. It's like the success sits between your ears. <laughs> and we can talk about these strategies, and it's like, if you're willing to be wrong, and if you really do put the pursuit of truth with a capital T front and center, uh, I think these types of strategies will, will certainly be ones that can serve you very well. Yeah, I love it. I love questions. Um, reminds me of a quote from uh, Richard Feynman, uh, the physicist. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, I wonder why, I wonder why I wonder, I wonder why I wonder why I wonder. And I might have butchered it because there's a whole yeah. lot of I wonder why I wonder why I wonder why. Yeah. But the idea there is it's like that, that curiosity leads to questions and those questions lead to better answers. Yeah, exactly right. Spot on. Um, I want to flip from some of the, uh, let's say, the LTV type discussions we were having. And in, in moving to acquiring customers, something you said was that how someone enters your world determines how long they stay and how long they pay. Yeah. Talk about like this framework or this mentality that you have about uh, acquisition. Yeah. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I believe I subscribe to the concept that we build purpose purposely built micro products for a specific avatar said another way i don't believe in the one size fits all solution hmm. so what that means is if you can match the value proposition to a specific person and deliver on the promise directly you will win i don't subscribe so I, you know for example i have a mentor of mine he's runs a publicly traded company we were talking about kind of what type of experience he would want to have. And I'm like, if I sold him a course, he would never buy. He's like, mm-hmm. don't, I, I don't want to spend, time is important to me. Um, totally. You know, I don't want to spend 10 hours learning how to improve my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> right. However, yeah. I will spend $25,000 for you to do it for me. Right. So this totally. is the DIY versus done for you, all that kind of stuff. Yep. And I think we miss that sometimes. And I think we sometimes fall into these traps of like, 
I'm going to put one product out and everyone will coalesce around that one product. And sometimes it's marketing and advertising and wrapping and things like that. But this idea of the better the fit on the way in, I believe is the greater the opportunity for someone to stay with you long-term because they feel like it's that hand in glove, right? Um, and so fitness was a great example of this. Like how many gyms say, we have a bunch of equipment. Well, maybe you have personal trainers and maybe you have a low ticket thing or something like that. So we built specialty programs for if you are, you know, an 18 year old guy, we have a power lifting, a, you know, uh, a build program. If you are a 65 year old woman, we have a strength and stability, a lot of the same exercises, but the packaging matters mm -hmm. and how people it's resonate with it and things like that. Exactly. So, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm a big believer in that first expectation that you set really does determine the longevity of that relationship. I like that. And there's a lot of ways that I can see this translating very well into e-commerce, um, which is different versions of products for different, you know, versions of, of your, uh, ideal customer profile as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, the, let's just say like the really kitsch version is just like, uh, you know, you've got the, the white version, uh, for the girls. And then you decide that you're going to launch the black version for the guys. And I've seen that done before. And it's like, that's a, that's a dumb example, but that sometimes that could be good. But where I really like where you're going with this is I would even say the, you, you talked about like the, if you can get the man at the right price for the right value, something along those lines, what I heard in my mind is, and I see this happen a lot in e-commerce, um, offering discounts for first time purchases, mm -hmm. I'm not totally against it. I don't love it. Uh, and I'll tell you one of my biggest reasons why is when we look at this from an LTV perspective, they tend to only want to be buying a lot of times at a discount then moving forward. You, you yep. may have acquired the wrong types of customers forever. And so they're always, they're never going to see the value in anything that you're selling ever again. Uh, whereas on the flip side, if you can sell them on that offer, you may have less total purchases, but you're more profitable on those purchases. And you've got the right type of customer who's likely going to see the value and they're going to stick around. Whereas if they came in because of the discount, um, they, they tend to stick around a little bit less because they're going to go with the mm -hmm. next person that does offer the discount that they want uh, moving forward. And so, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. Yeah. So in, in our gyms, you know, back in the kind of the group on daily mm -hmm. deal kind of wave, when you attract deal seekers, you're exactly right. They are motivated by the deal. Right. And so, you know, I think you, you do set that expectation that, you know, until things are on sale, uh, you, you severely limit your ability to, uh, to engage and, and, uh, uh, and keep that person, uh, long-term. Yeah. The only real time that I see a good play for that in, in my personal feeling of this, and, and there's so many nuances to this, so I'm not going to say this is tried and true across the board, but is when you are completely just getting started and you're using this as a way to get some initial traction. And I think that there's sometimes some value to that when you have zero customers, zero marketing budget, whatever. And you're like, Hey, I need to get something in the door. And, um, I could see that being a, a good play. Um, but for as short a period of time as possible until you can actually just really start selling it for the value that it is. Yeah. And on that point, one thing I, and you're absolutely right. There's, there's a lot of nuance to this, but, um, the question I would ask is, does the discount and the acquisition need to be mutually exclusive? Hmm. Meaning, no. yeah. can you still go to the same person and say, hey, wait, I'm just getting started. You know, but based on everything I know about you, you might be the perfect person for this thing. I'll give you the test drive mm -hmm. on two conditions. One, tell me if you love it or hate it. And if you happen to love it, I'd love for you, you to just shoot me a quick testimonial just to let somebody else know what your experience was like. It would mean the world to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm not, because a discount, obviously, is, as we kind of walk through, would be some kind of uh, requiem on value, mm -hmm. when really what you want is how can I take this experience and then daisy chain that into a future? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think we can think a little bit differently and a little more strategically in, in how we deploy some of those things, but you're, you're spot on. And I've seen that done very well on things like AppSumo or Product Hunt mm. where, great, you're just, you're getting it on there. You're getting a mass. You're ideally getting a, a maybe a little bit more involved user who is basically, like you said, like it's a, it's a beta user. They're past the alpha. You're in the beta stage. You're getting the beta user. They're paying for a little bit for it. You're getting that feedback. They're going to use it and uh, test things out thoroughly and, and uh, 
I'm with you on that. Yeah. Um, something you talked about on your podcast that I really appreciated as well. Um, so leveling the field, uh, I, and I want you to go into it more because I really appreciate this, which was putting the power down. Um, explain this to me like I'm five here. What is putting okay. the power down? So I'm going to, the disclaimer is I am a massive Formula One race fan. So I'm going to go with some car analogies. We went from baseball to cars. Okay. Imagine for anyone who's ever driven a car, put your car in neutral and put your foot on the gas and tell me what kind of progress you make. <laughs> Probably somewhere close to none. <laughs> yeah. However, you're burning fuel and a lot of things are happening. A lot of activity is happening, but you are making no progress. And I think the more I see folks continuing to do more of what they've done, thinking that progress expands either literally or quadratically, like either, either one for one or one to many, if it's right. not getting to where you want to go, chances are you're in some form of neutral. And I think let's look at some of these very, you know, I'm firing on all cylinders. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've got my foot on the gas. All of these kind of connotations that we have is actually about effort when really it's actually about how much of that effort, that power actually makes it to the wheels. Again, I'm a huge car fan. A, there's a, a car built by Bugatti that was uh, like a million dollar car. They put two engines basically bolted together, make 1,600 horsepower or uh, 1,200 horsepower at the wheels. What most people don't know is that engine makes 3,500 horsepower. So you go, well, wow. where the heck did the rest of it go? And without going too technically, it's heat effectively is where the rest of the energy goes. But you're talking about to make progress, you're losing two-thirds of, you know, of the potential. And just so often, I think we just think in terms of more mm -hmm. when really we should be thinking efficiency. And the, the difference between the two is the transmission. Are you in the wrong gear? And so often if we stop and think about, I'm like redlining, I'm, I'm, my engine is spinning really, really fast. I'm in first gear. Instead of saying I need to press down harder on the accelerator, maybe you need to change gears. And it's just a, it's a good reminder, I think, for for anyone who feels burnt out, feels like they're burning the candle at both ends, um, to that there might be an alternative approach, uh, which will actually deliver more, more impacts. So hearing you talk about this, um, I was just down in Florida on uh, spring break with my family, and you know, on some of the beaches down there, they have the signs up there that talk about uh, you know rip tides and and things like that, and what you should do, and it kind of you know explains things, um, and. You, you don't know if you've ever seen, you know, anybody drowning, hopefully not in real life, but, you know, in a movie or something like that. And it's like they're flailing their arms. They're just going crazy and they're doing a lot. They are very much busy, um, but it's not an effective busyness, right? Because um, they're still drowning. Uh, whereas if you see what it talks about, it's like with the riptides. And I'm, I, <laughs> I maybe didn't read it closely as I should have. But it's basically along the lines of it's like kind of like let the riptide kind of pull you where it needs to so you're not fighting it and you're wasting all that energy and then begin to swim parallel to the shore instead of trying to swim back to the shore and then get out of that tide, that, that riptide or whatever, that current, and then you can get back. Um, I have to call out the little thumbs up there because it did it for you too. It's been doing yeah. that a couple of times and it's so funny. Um, Love it. But, but, but getting back to this here. So, you know. I think to your point where it's like, is, is the, is the movement that you're making, is it actually effective movement forward and doing the right things? And sometimes you have to stop what you're doing for a little bit, reassess and focus. And I think, uh, EOS calls these, I think like focus days, right. Where it's like, you need to get out of the business for a little bit, set up some time where you're just going to say, I want to look at this top down. What am I working on? That's working. What am I working on? That's not working. What should be delegated to somebody else? Because it's still important, needs to get done. It's just maybe not you that needs to be doing it. Things like that. I, I think that last point that you just made is the one I would, especially for anyone who's kind of has an existing business and wants to maximize the per unit of time that they spend, you know, output per unit of time. It's that last piece. 
which is mm-hmm. most of the time that I have found where things start to level off or even you know you regress as far as progress is when you are outside of your zone of genius and your core comp- you know your core competency. Uh, great book if you have not read it, Dan Martell, famous SAS. SAS Academy, et cetera, uh, wrote Buy Back Your Time. And it is a a step-by-step of how to address that core problem. And if you are outside of the the Venn diagram of what feeds you, what you're good at, and what generates profits or revenue for your business, every minute you spend outside of that, you're spinning the engine, but no power to the wheels. And so I would encourage you to think in, in those terms. Yeah, I love that. Um, and yeah, great book and love a lot of Dan Martell stuff. I've been following him for years as well, ever since I was yeah. in SAS too. So that's a great call out. Um, I want to dig into the who is Tim Kalise side of the podcast now as well. Yeah. Hearing the way that you think about business and the way that you think about things, um, it seems like you have always had this kind of mindset. You knew you were going to be this guy. And so uh, from what I understand, you carried a briefcase around. This, with this, you, this you is like my dating were... history in like in two <laughs> seconds, which is pretty much you're exactly right. Which yeah. which started later in life because of what you're about to say, which you're you're spot on. Yeah, you carried a briefcase with you in what like middle school or whatever. So like yes. this this was you knew where you were going. You were like, I'm going to put on my white Oxford button down shirt and I'm going to carry my briefcase. Like I'm on I'm on my path. Uh, yes. Uh, Again, made me wildly popular beyond my my <laughs> any expectation I ever had. Um, but yeah, my dad was in financial services. He was the guy who put the suit on, you know, took yep. the train to work. And I think in the beginning, it was pure emulation. It was just it's what I saw. But I got a little bit later, you know, kind of into high school, and I knew I was wired a little bit differently. Um, my perspective at that time was, as most sons who you know who want to kind of be like their dad, um, my vision of what that looked like was more of like I was signing up to be a gladiator. And the paradigm that I heard or observed was effectively, he who can withstand the most pain wins. Hmm. And I have always been wired. I have much more of a a sense of a softer side, if you call it that, uh, which I now take great pride in, which for a long time, I was kind of like, you got to man up and all of those types of things. I just identified with people in a different way. And when you are looking at problems to be solved, um, struggles that people have, I think that combined empathy with this brain that works of like being a problem solver and breaking things down to component parts and first order thinking and all of those types of things, which in middle school, you have no idea what that actually means. But in hindsight, I kind of look at it and and put some words around it. Um, But it gave me great joy to be a creator from the standpoint of being a a bridge builder. How do I take someone from their current state to a, a future state that they desire? And if I can have a hand in that, I realize very quickly that that fed me, fed my energy, uh, in, in many, many ways. I love that. Um, I think kind of what you just talked about is that idea where it's like, you can have a zone of genius, but then there's usually gotta be something else that separates you as well. Right. And so for you, it's like, you have this zone of genius of being a problem solver. There's a lot of problem solvers, but you're the zone of genius. Who's the problem solver who also has this side of empathy. So that Mm -hmm. allowed you to be a very different type of problem solver than just everybody else who's the same problem solver yeah yeah spot on and it's it's interesting so just kind of high story arc you know i went from finance so kid in middle school carrying a briefcase to i started two companies while i was in college so kind of entrepreneurial then i went to finance then i went to fitness and technology then i went to consulting and coaching uh and most people would look at and go so you've got kind of varied you know, story arc here. But the through line is the interesting part for me, which is that each one of those steps, it was I uncovered in hindsight looking back, the thing that it ties back to those those items. 
It was the empath meets the problem solver with authenticity. Mm -hmm. I raised $350 million from mom and pop investors whose sole reason for trusting me, I'm 22 asking them to give me a million dollars, was a belief that they had safety. Mm. I should not have been able to do what I did. And I, that's not like a boast. It's a, I just didn't know any different. So my empath sure. meets practitioner served me very well during that time. We then shut that fund down December 31st of 2007 and said, this is going to get ugly and we don't want to be a participant. Go to safety. Wow. 98% of our investors said that we were wrong and we had lost our touch. 99% of our investors, I, most of them I still keep in touch with because they came back and said, you were right. So it's, wow. again, the through line is fitness. Same thing. I like, how can I take someone in an authentic way? We built fitness facilities that were not around sign up and never come. It was all around uh, proper launch and activation and retention. And then coaching. Coaching at its core is how do you be a mentor and a guide uh, for someone who desires something new and, and improved for, for their life? Uh, and so I take great pride in being able to, you know, almost like not to kind of stay that course and stay as close to that, that through line as I, as I possibly can through these different chapters of my life. I love it. And that actually leads well into um, another quote uh, that you live by that you told me, and hopefully I don't butcher it, but transformations don't happen in isolation. Yes. Tell me about yeah. this quote and why is that one that you just love? Uh, I, I love it because you, this is probably a theme that you, you've heard earlier in my life. When things got hard, I went inward. It's time to buckle down. Time, this is the grit part, tough, you know, let's tough through, whatever it might be. And the reality is every transition point in my life has come either because of or in concert with somebody seeing something in me or me pursuing a, a different opinion or point of view uh, that has resonated and allowed me to move from kind of one avatar, you know, kind of one version of myself to another. And the only way that you can do that is by having, you know, it's like the, the, the quote, um, you can't read the label from inside the bottle. Mm, yeah. And those two for me go hand in hand. It's like, oh, somebody else sees something that I don't see. And being around other people, you change your environment, you change your future. It's like, oh, I need to do more of that. So the more situations I have put myself in, live events change lives, being around communities, get in the better room. A lot of these quotes kind of all coalesce around this idea of we all go through, you know, transformation is inevitable. You know, everybody has chapters in their life, mm -hmm. but they don't happen sitting in front of a computer, buckling down. It typically happens in concert with somebody else. I really like that. Um, I know that you had mentioned in, in our pre-show before, too, that you're a big, um, big fan of having mentors. Um, mm. And I'm as well. I've, I've got an article I wrote on Entrepreneur years ago called Find a Mentor or Die Trying, because I, I think it's that important kind of thing. And, yeah. um, I've been blessed to have many great mentors over the years as well, and I, I can fully agree with what you're saying there where it's like a lot of the most pivotal things in my own transformation I can say oh yeah I can actually point to something that one of my mentors told me that I go oh got it that makes sense mm -hmm. you see something that I didn't see yeah yeah I mean it whether you like love him or hate him Grant Cardone and his 10x concept has fundamentally just the one question you don't have to talk to him or anything like that and go okay if I wanted to make a million dollars next year or a hundred thousand dollars and I Maybe I should shoot for 10 million. Like it, that alone has caused people to stop thinking as small and gone bigger. It's a very, mm -hmm. you know, probably basic example, but a mentor, you know, Alex talks about, and, and I, I greatly appreciated the idea. He talks about so often in his life, especially early on and through his maturation, all it has been is just changing the value vehicle that he's in. When he started, it was, I'm going to launch a gym and I will help the people in the community in which I serve. Then he had six gyms and he helped build a team and was more regional. 
And then he went to, Jim Launch started actually with him and others flying out and actually launching gyms. That's where the name came from. So the value vehicle went more to like intellectual property with some implementation. And then everybody hated getting on planes and living away from their families and all the rest. So then it was like, well, we'll just strip out the IP and create an info business effectively. And then it was a coaching business. You can just see the levels of, of leverage mm -hmm. improving over time. And I think somebody else just needs to look at us and go, you're playing tiddlywinks, you should be playing chess. And you just don't know sometimes what game you're playing until somebody calls you out, right? And 100%. you know whether it be the you know 10x is easier than 2x or whatever phrasing you want to use, I just think by and large, we have an opportunity to do bigger and better things. Um, and typically those things don't happen in a vacuum. 100%. Um... I really like talking about, uh, let's say, a continuation of what we're talking about, but specifically how you're up arrowing um, your own life. Um, and, and by up arrow, uh, just for those who are listening, um, it's a mathematical thing. Uh, Newth's up arrow, uh, it's for used for making massively large numbers like Graham's number, way beyond exponentiation. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're up arrowing in business, but how do we up arrow? Uh, our, our personal lives. And one of the things that you talked to me about is being a husband, father of three, you've reverse engineered your life around your kids, which is sometimes uh, maybe often at odds with business success. What, what do you mean? What are some ways that you've uh, done this and, and why? So uh, we've all kind of, we're all familiar with the idea that kind of, if you give, let's just say you have a task to do, you give yourself 30 days to do it. This was something we did at Gym Launch, which was like, okay, we have something to do. I'll get it to you by Monday. Like, it's Friday at two o'clock. Can you get it to me by three o'clock? And we just compress time. And it's because when you give, obviously, space, things will fill to the volume of, of that you give it. I would use a similar analogy, which is the reverse engineering for me was, what are the big rocks that I want to cover first and then work backwards? And I think for myself, quarterly, I go through kind of what are my priorities? I actually it was uh, a, a wonderful person. Her name's Taryn, just did a, a great presentation on Wednesday night that I was a part of. Um, and it's basically about reverse engineering your calendar and things like that. But it's around your priorities. And the question that came up, which was super interesting, was I can do this, like I can reverse engineer, but what if my calendar doesn't look, doesn't reflect my priorities? I'm making a calendar of who I want to be, not who I am. And I think that paradox was exactly why I've taken this perspective, which is like, I need to establish who I want to be and remove all of the other kind of ways that that can go wrong. And the way for me to do that was to, to basically reverse engineer my life. So I, and that doesn't mean I don't go through seasons. I am not a work-life balance person. It's like, in this moment, this is how it's going to go. In this moment, so what I strive to achieve as much as possible is just presence and present, being present in whatever I do. And instead, I just kind of did a half in, half out for a very long period of time, and it did get me to where I wanted to go. I love that. Um, yeah. You you called them rocks. Are you an EOS fan? Uh, I am not by, by discipline, but, uh, you know, I think one of my, I have my kids watching it as too, you know, there's, I think there's a, a famous YouTube video as a professor or whatever it said, you know, here's the bottle and you know, you yes. put a bunch of stuff and it's like, is it filled? And then you, That's you know, right, that whole thing. Go. Yes. Yeah. I, I, it's the exact same concept, but I think, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, there's, there's science behind why this is, but it's kind of like, uh, you think with a different part of your brain in planning today than execution tomorrow. Which is like, if you let your brain tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. ask if you want to get up and go work out, sure. the answer 99% of the time for most of the people will be no. Yeah, That's because it's, it's just a different decision-making part of your brain. So I try to do any planning with objectivity instead of in the moment. And so just process-wise, that's the reverse engineering process for me has always been the way that I've approached things. Start with the end it's of like mind and work backwards. It's like going to the grocery store hungry. <laughs> it's not the best, exactly not the right. best time to go there. Yeah. Um, make your list before you get there. 
you know, I, I think the thing that I like about what you're talking about that I, I actually try to do that as well. And it's because of that exact analogy of, you, you know, you're putting the rocks in there and then the sand and the pebbles and the dirt and the water. And it's like, well, if you do it in the wrong order, then the, you know, it doesn't fit. But if you put the rocks in first, it does. And um, I try to do that as well with my own calendar, too. And it's like, OK, date night with life. Right. It's like the rock. It has to be a rock because of like yeah. me being able to have a successful marriage with her, you know, beyond this business, beyond when the kids are raised, it's like that's an important thing. And to your point, I'm not always perfect at it either, but like it's something that she and I are try to be intentional about with things like that. Um, and establishing those, those, uh, I don't know, reverse engineering your calendar. I like that putting the calendar in that you want of who you want to be. I think that's yeah. a good yeah. way to say it. Um, you also told me along the lines of, let's just say, up arrowing your life. You were talking about how we misunderstand financial freedom. And I thought this was good mm. to get into. Like, we have the wrong definition sometimes of financial freedom. Um, talk to me a little bit more about this. Yeah. So I think for someone who grew up, you know, looking at, I made a statement when I was like 18, said, I want to be retired when I'm 30. Which, sure. fine. It's like, it sounds good. But in that kind of line of thinking, it's like, I will, and I think many of us have fallen into this, I will feel secure with some number in the bank. If only I had mm -hmm. blank dollars in a bank account, then I can retire and be free and all of those types of things. That is what I term as kind of like a balance sheet item, right? It's a number on a page. Sure. But in reality... Financial freedom as I define it today is how do I engineer a system of my life to produce passive income greater than my monthly expenses? So go with me for a second. So if you said this month, it cost me $10,000 to run my life. If you had passive income, not active income, passive income of $15,000, you could theoretically do whatever you want with your time. And we just talked about kind of a calendar. My ideal outcome is that I can get to 200% of my monthly expenses in passive income, which will allow me to have an open calendar. It's not going to happen in the next kind of quarters, but my pursuit is in the next five years to be able to hit that number. Hmm. If you believe that to be true, two important things happen. One is the idea of retirement being like, I'm just going to go put my feet in the sand uh, sometime 40 years from now. I just don't believe in that concept. It's really hard to do like deferred, you know, uh, sacrifice and all of that. But mm -hmm. if you could say, I want to turn my active income today into passive income tomorrow so that I can live the life that I want, I'm all game. I'm, I'm game for that. So that's, that's the first. And the second is depending on which stats you, you listen to, but you know, having been in the marketplace for now 20 years, I've, I've seen the, the manifestation of this. Something north of 90% of businesses under $10 million a year or a little bit more don't sell for any real number or they sell for liquidation value. Which means if you start a business and say, I'm going to sacrifice for the next X number of years and it will all be worth it when I hit this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, for 90% plus of us, that will not happen. So if you want to have control over your future, there has to be an alternative, which interestingly makes you more cash flow focused in the short term, which allows you to turn your active income into passive income. So mm -hmm. you take the pressure off of the business and you actually have a more efficient business, which arguably has a greater chance of selling down the road. Wow. So does that track? Like that. So that it, it has fundamentally changed the lens in which I look at wealth building. Wealth is not a number; it is a ratio. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we can think about that, the better off we all will be. I haven't heard it said like that before, but I really like that. Um, Tim, I think we're at time. It has been absolutely incredible talking to you. If people wanted to work with you follow you, what is the best way for them to get in touch, stay in touch? Yeah. So website is timcalise.com, T-I-M-C-A-L-I-S-E.com. Uh, and Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook, I'm on all three and I monitor all my own DMs. So if anything resonated with you, um, DM me, arrow, 
A-R-R-O-W, on any of those channels. Uh, and I will know that you listen to this show and I've got some special gifts, um, but would love to do anything I can for your audience. Uh, if anything resonated, and quite frankly, would love to know what resonated with you um, and happy to help in any way I can. That's awesome. I cannot appreciate you enough. This has been absolutely fantastic talking to you. Thank you for coming on. Well, thank you so much for, for having me on the show. It's been wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks for listening to the Up Arrow podcast with William Harris. We'll see you again next time, and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.